Hello, welcome everyone. Can you see me? Uh, can you see my screen? Great. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Sam and Yusuf uh, Apollinus. Great. So uh, we are uh, hopefully ready. Uh, again, hello and welcome this webinar from AZ Tech. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today to present one of the most important emerging technologies, which is uh, blockchain. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sharb al I'm a senior consultant with AZ Tech, uh, specializing in blockchain, uh, digital transformation, and fintech. I'm the co-founder and the CTO of Blockchain Leaders, a consultancy firm operating in the MENA region and in Canada. Uh, I'm certified blockchain architect and finance professional. Uh, I'm working as advisor for multiple blockchain projects in uh, health, uh, supply chain, education, energy, and finance. Uh, also, I'm a university lecturer uh, teaching computer networks and cybersecurity courses. Finally, uh, I'm the founder and the managing partner of uh, USA, SAL, a system integration company, since 2012. In this session uh, today, we are going to introduce blockchain as technology without uh, going deep into technical functionalities, protocols, or architecture. So uh, in our agenda for today, we'll define the trust protocol. Then we will compare the internet of information and the internet of value. We'll define blockchain. We'll see what are the most important blockchain key concepts. And finally, we'll talk and discuss some blockchain use cases, some blockchain projects from the real world. Uh, at the end, we will have like 10 or uh, 12 minutes for a Q&A session. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Uh, let me start with the following key question. What controls our life? Emotional brain states such as love, respect, trust, etc., controls our daily life and actions. But at the end, it all goes down to trust. Because without trust, you can't find love or even respect or loyalty. Trust is a central part of all human relationships, including a romantic, family life, politics medical practices, and of course, what is important for us, business operations. So how easy is to build trust? Let's do some assumptions. Well, if I tell you that an unknown merchant in China, for example, can sell you the iPhone 11 for $300, would you go online and buy it? Do you trust him? What if this product is offered on AliExpress and is covered by AliExpress guarantee. Would you buy it now? What if a stranger offers to give you a ride for a fee less than Uber, for example? Would you go with him? Do you trust giving me like $10,000 for a year and I will give it back to you 12,000 next year? What about your bank? Do you trust giving that to your bank? The technology likely to have the greatest impact on the next few decades has arrived. And it's not social media, it's not big data, 
and it's not robotics. Even it's not AI. You will be surprised to learn that it's the underlying technology uh, of digital currencies like Bitcoin. You all heard about Bitcoin. And the technology is called blockchain. Now, I know it's not the most booming word in the world, but I believe that this is now the next generation of the internet and that it holds vast potential for every kind of business, every society, and for all of you individually. For the first time in human history, people everywhere can trust each other and transact peer to peer. The trust is established not by some big institution or a company or a middleman, but by collaboration and by cryptography and by some clever code. And because trust is native to the blockchain technology, we can call blockchain the trust protocol. So, Whenever we need to build trust between unknown peers or we have to separate what is real from what is fake and eliminate the need for intermediaries, also provide a way to trace anything from its origin. Whenever we need to able audit any kind of transaction and to combat fraud or corruption, we can use the trust protocol or blockchain. Well, you know, for the past few decades, we have had the Internet of Information, the World Wide Web. And when I send an email to a colleague or to a business partner, and, and uh, I attach within a, an image or a file, a document, I'm not actually sending the real or the original document. I'm sending a copy. And that was working great so far. This is what we call democratized information. In other terms, make something accessible to everyone. And the internet has proven with those last 20 or 30 years, a lot of applications. But when it comes to assets, Things like money, uh, financial assets like stocks, uh, bonds, loyalty points, intellectual properties, music, or a vote, or any other asset, sending you a copy is really a bad idea. Imagine if I send Bob $100, it's really important that I don't still have the same money and that I can't send it again the same hundred dollar to Alice. This is a major problem when we talk about assets, about value. This has been called the double spending problem by cryptographers for a long time. So today, we rely entirely on big intermediaries. Those middlemen, like banks, governments, big social media companies, the credit card companies, the money transfer companies, and brokers from all kinds, real estate, insurance, all that, just to establish the trust in our economy. And these intermediaries perform all the business and transaction logic of every kind of commerce, from authentication, identification of people, uh, through clearing, settling, and uh, record keeping. And overall, they do a pretty good job. But there's, there are some growing problems. To begin, uh, they are centralized. That means they can be hacked. JP Morgan, US federal government, LinkedIn, Home Depot, and others are examples of big organization being hacked. Second, they exclude billions of people from the global economy. 
For example, people who don't have enough money to have a bank account, what we call the unbanked, they also slow things down. Well, it can take a second for an email to go around the world, but it can take days or weeks for a money to, be, to move through the banking system across a city or the same country. The most important part is they take a big piece of the action. 10 to 20% of commission just to send money to another country. So the question that we're trying to, to answer today, do we really need them? Do we really need those intermediaries? Blockchain will help us to answer this question. As per Wikipedia, blockchain is an open distributed ledger that records transactions between two parties efficiently and in a verifiable and permanent way. It, should, it is also a distributed database existing on various computers at, its, at the same time and not on a single repository or server. So usually we have a database on an, in a given server in a centralized mode where all the connection is done using a client server system. So like the bank, like the insurance company, we have the server at their headquarters and the connection is directly through uh, this server. Blockchain is distributed database so we don't have a single database on a single repository but it exists at each computer of the network of this blockchain it's a decentralized technology tracking digital assets on a peer-to-peer -peer network while cryptographically chains block in a chronological order as you can see here we have the first block that we call genesis block and each block after this block is connected via cryptography in kind of encryption so the, the chronological order is respected and we can't uh, alter this order so block two will remain after block one and before block three and it is protected via cryptography we'll talk in details about that So, some history about blockchain. In 2008, the financial industry crashed, like what's happening right now. And hopefully, an anonymous person or persons, we still don't know, named Satoshi Nakamoto, created a paper where he developed a protocol for a digital cash that used an underlying crypto cryptocurrency. And he called that Bitcoin. And this cryptocurrency enabled people to establish trust and do transaction without a third party. So people using Bitcoin, as per the paper of Satoshi Nakamoto, can transact peer to peer. They can send money to them to, to others, to friends, to their, to relatives without a bank, without a money transfer company. So here, please don't be confused about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, as I described, is an asset. It goes up and down, and that should be of interest to you if you are an investor. More broadly, it's a cryptocurrency. It's not a fiat currency controlled by a nation state or a central bank like the dollar, euro, pound. But the real point here is the underlying technology. It's called the blockchain, and that's what is important for us. So just like Google and Facebook are two applications of the internet, the internet of information, Bitcoin is the most famous application of blockchain among hundreds of other applications. We have Ethereum, Ripple, Hyperledger, Corda, Corum, and we'll discuss later on some blockchain projects. So, what are blockchain main criteria? 
why blockchain is important. First, it's a it's a, a called a distributed ledger. We will discuss in details in the, in the next slides each one of these points. It uses cryptography. It is a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's decentralized. As I mentioned before, there's no central authority for blockchain. It is highly secure. For sure, it's trust because it used the blockchain, the trust protocol. It used what we call a group consensus or a consensus mechanism, and it's immutable. Let's start by the distributed ledger. You all remember this book ledger used between uh, any shops or shops or companies. It's, it's mainly used since the beginning of the trade between people. It, it's mainly it's used for record keeping device that allow the keeper to tell a story. For example, the ownership or the history of ownership, the transactions, and the track, it track assets of any data. So why blockchain is a distributed ledger? Why it's similar to the old book ledger? In order to understand, well, uh, the distributed ledger thing, let's do an anal analogy with a normal book. In the traditional book-based ledger, each page refers to a block connected to the previous page through a page number. So in, in blockchain, each book is the blockchain. The book is the blockchain. Each page is a block, and each entry in a page is a blockchain transaction. So we have multiple blocks connected together. The whole blockchain is the book. Each block is a page, and each entry in the page is a blockchain transaction. So we know it's easy to detect if a, if a page or a block has been removed or deleted from, from the book. And easy to arrange book pages and identify suspicious activity. That's why we have page numbers. And since the pages or blocks are built tight on top of each other, it's impossible to tamper a previous entry in the ledger without someone noticing it. So if I take a, a page from the book, we can see it. Uh, if I uh, uh, try to alter an entry in the book, everyone can see it. So uh, that's why blockchain is similar to what we call the ledger book. So what we, can we start a store on a ledger? On a distributed ledger, we can store financial transaction, like in the case of a Bitcoin. Whenever Alice and Bob send Bitcoin together, we can store digital IDs. We can store health records. And it's, it's very important to have our health records on a blockchain. We can store property and land records, shipments and inventory, grades and certificates. We can uh, store as much assets as, as we want when trust is needed. When the blockchain can help, we can store these assets. So. Moving to cryptography. How blockchain data is encrypted? We have that, what we call a digital signature. It's a combination of public and private keys used to sign and encrypt any new transaction on the blockchain. It's similar to your signature. Whenever you go to the bank, you have to uh, take some money, put some money, do any, any kind of uh, transaction. They take your signature. Here, it's all digital. So we have what we call digital signature. And the digital signature is a combination of two keys or two passwords. One we call public and one we call private. To simplify, 
just think about as your email where the address your email address is the public key because everybody knows your address and they can use to send you emails and the password is your private key and this one is kept as secret it's not for sharing and you use it only to open and read emails so based on that with a higher degree of cryptography we are securing all transactions in a blockchain decentralization it's a very attractive because it implies there is no single point of failure in, in the network. That is, no single authority will be able to take away your asset or change history to suit their needs. Take an example, a database with an administrator that have a higher access. An administrator can do everything in a database. He can delete records, he can add records, he can edit records effectively. So in blockchain, it's decentralized. In traditional database, the data is connected and stored, as we said before, on a central database, on a server. We have limited access by one or more person, the administrators only. We have bottlenecks that can occur when we have high traffic on the server. And it's highly dependent on network connectivity, which means that when the main node or the server fails, the entire data database become inaccessible. This is a major problem in traditional database system that we call single point of failure. In blockchain, data is interconnected and thus it is decentralized. As you can see, the uh, nodes are interconnected together. And most data is local and close proximity to where they are needed. So if I have a node and I need my data, I have the data on locally on the node. And addition or removal of site is much easier where the control is local. And the most important part, when one or more nodes fail in the blockchain, the database remains accessible. Moving to group consensus. It's a new term used in blockchain mainly. In a centralized organization, all the decisions are taken by the leader or a board of decision makers. But this is not impossible in a blockchain because blockchain has no leader simply. For the blockchain to make decisions, they need to come to a consensus or to an agreement using consensus mechanism. So what is consensus? As per Webster, Consensus decision-making is a group decision-making process in which group members develop and agree to support a decision in the best interest of the whole. So simply, it's the democracy that rules in the blockchain. In order to understand clearly what consensus, let's define in the next slide the mining. What is mining in blockchain? Well, mining is the process of recording the pending transaction by adding new blocks into the blockchain through a mathematical puzzle that we call proof of work. Out there, uh, around the world, there is a group of people called miners. They are blockchain miners. They have those massive computing power at their fingerprints. And every 10 minutes, kind of like the heartbeat of a network, a block gets created that has all the transactions from the previous 10 minutes. The miners compete in trying to solve this mathematical problem, a tough mathematical problem. The first miner to find out the truth and to validate the block is rewarded in digital currency. In the case of Bitcoin, the word currently is 6.25 BTC uh, as of May 12. And effectively, this is how Bitcoin is produced or mined. 
So whenever we add, we have to add a new block, miners will compete together to find a mathematical question. The first one that validates the question will get rewarded in 6.25 Bitcoin. And effectively, this is how we produce Bitcoin. So once a miner solve the given problem, he declares the solution to the whole, all nodes. And block validation starts using consensus algorithm. So here we can see the importance of consensus algorithm. So consensus is simply the way how the nodes uh, verify and prove that the work done by the miner was correct and the transaction in the block are all good. So we have to validate that the transaction is valid, not a fault transaction, or someone is trying to uh, uh, steal money or something like that. So once the new block get more than 51% of the votes, again, the consensus, the democracy, it will be confirmed and added to the blockchain. So mining and consensus come together. Miners should compete to solve a, 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 an equation and mathematical puzzle in what we call proof of work. After they solve it, they publish the result to the whole nodes. Once the result gets more than 51% approval from the, no, from the nodes, a vote from the all nodes, the block is added to the blockchain. So again, there's no single authority that validates those transactions. All the nodes will validate, will be included in this consensus algorithm to validate any given transaction. So how blocks are chained? And this is the key part. Once this new block is linked to the previous block to create the chain of blocks, here the name blockchain, and everyone and every new block is timestamped, kind of like with a digital waxed seed. So it's impossible to change the order of the blocks, neither any data inside any block. Trying to do that will alter the whole blockchain, and the node doing such malicious, malicious action will be compromised because using Cryptography, as I told you uh, first, each block contains what we call the hash function of the previous block. And they are interconnected in timestamp and uh, using the hash function, the encryption function. So it's possible to change the order or to change the data inside the block because it will alter also the order. So if I wanted to go and hack a block, and say, I will pay Alice and Bob with the same money. Do you remember the, our example of $100? I'd have to hack the block, that block, plus all the preceding blocks, the entire history of commerce on the blockchain, not just one computer, but across millions of computers simultaneously, and all using the highest level of encryption in the light of the most powerful computing resources in the world that's watching me. So it's very tough to do it, and yet it's impossible. This is infinitely more secure than the computer systems that we have today. We call that the 51% rule. If you want to hijack a blockchain, you have to make sure that more than 51% of the nodes will support you, and this is impossible. That's why blockchain is highly secure. Last one is immutability. One cannot change the information stored in a block or delete a block without altering subsequent blocks. So as I told you uh, previously, you can see here that in block four, we have in the block four, what we call the previous hash. Trying to change the previous hash from the block three will, uh, will alter the whole uh, blockchain. So it's impossible. You can see in 
block zero and block block one and block two that in block two we have the data we have the previous hash which is the hash of block one zero five six f x uh, f h and in block three we have the previous hash of block two if we try to change the previous hash in block four or to change the data of block four we have to change the data in block three block two going to the genesis block and this is immutability so let's do our own definition now. blockchain it's a decentralized database stores information in the form of transactions the stored data is immutable and get, data gets recorded via consensus-based algorithm. It's highly secure, it uses cryptography, and it exists over a peer-to-peer -peer network. It can be like public or private blockchain. So here's our definition. Blockchain is a consensus-based, secure, decentralized, public or private database, which stores information immutably over a peer-to-peer -peer network. So Bitcoin blockchain is just one. There are many other applications. The Ethereum blockchain, one of the blockchain applications, was developed by a Canadian named Vitalik Buterin. He's like 22 years old. And this blockchain has extraordinary capabilities. One of them is that you can build smart tracks. It's kind of what it sounds like. It's a contract that self-executes self and the contract handles the enforcement, the management, performance, uh, even payment. The contract is kind of like has a bank account in a sense of agreements between people. So imagine buying a house is as easy as click of a button similar to buying a mobile. Do you think it's even possible? The primary reason why buying a house or land is cumbersome and hectic is due to lack of trust. What if the land or property is not legitimate, if the current owner uh, legal, or if all documents are fake, literally have to wear a detective hat and toil for months even spend money on intermediaries, brokers to validate as well. This is where smart contracts and blockchain bring the trust. Just imagine if the complete details uh, about the land, property, is on a blockchain platform, and due to immutability, no one can be able to tamper or fake any data in blockchain. Adding to this another attribute, which is provenance or traceability. You can, the complete history of the property is crystal clear and no way to manipulate. So you can know if uh, who, who were the owners of this property since the beginning till now using a blockchain platform. And today on Ethereum block, blockchain, there are projects underway to do everything uh, from creating new replacement for the stock market to tracing products, uh, fighting fraud, and counterfeiting uh, to creating a new model of, of democracy uh, where politicians are accountable to citizens. For example, uh, in March uh, 2018, Sierra, Sierra Leone, the African country, was first nation that ran a blockchain-based election. So a lot of applications. In, in the blockchain field and especially with Ethereum. Now, starting 2016 and 17, blockchain started to gain this recognition in wider audiences, which led to a significant increase in the proposal software applications and services based on blockchain. According to the World Economic Forum, following investment is expected from the blockchain technology. Currently, we are in the growing phase, 
and we are seeing more and more projects, proof of concepts, pilot projects. But in 2023, in the development phase, where a lot of product launches, it will be the age of consortium, alliances, and governance of blockchain. In 2024, blockchain will reach the inflection point where it will attain critical mass. And in 2025, uh, this is what we call the point of no return, and blockchain will be used in 85% of the global technology. Well, it should come as no surprise that most numerous attempts of using a blockchain are happening in the financial sector. In large part, this is due to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies which have showcased the blockchain to the rest of the world. But Hillman and Roche, in their global blockchain benchmarking study published last year, have estimated that about 30% of blockchain use cases are related to banking and financial services. But monetary aspect is just a tip of the iceberg of blockchain technology. Blockchain is a groundbreaking technology for which money is merely one of the possible applications. And blockchain has gained contraction in other sectors, such as government, insurance, healthcare, education, or uh, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a huge focus on blockchain in what we called PMS, or Pandemic Management System, or simply Pandemic Fighting Solution. Uh, and even in medical supply chain management. These applications will continue to grow in the post-pandemic period because of the fear of new COVID-19 waves and any similar diseases. You have heard of a lot of uh, PMS projects, maybe using blockchain or no, uh, using your mobile phone, you have an application that will track your location, your health, it will monitor your vital uh, sensors like uh, temperature, uh, all that. Using blockchain, we can do a PMS by respecting what we call sover sovereign identity, your privacy, which is most important. However, blockchain can be applied in several other verticals like data management, uh, verification, fraud and corruption fighting, voting, e-citizenship, uh, land registration, intellectual property, uh, international trade, supply chain, uh, securing IoT, energy, and a lot more. Well, let's start by the financial services. Do you know exactly what happens when you pay using your card? I mean, you, you go to the corner store, you buy want to buy a donut, and you give your card to the cashier. When, once he tap your card, a bit stream goes through a dozen of companies, each with their own computer system. Some of them being using 1970s mainframes, and three or four days later, a settlement occurs. The money was withdrawn from your account. Look at this eight steps process uh, in the picture. Starting from you as a cardholder, Moving to the merchant POS, the merchant bank, the card network, the card, the network banks, back to you as cardholder. It's a very complex process, simply to buy a donut. Well, why not transacting directly between you and the seller? At the end, you were buying a donut and he was selling it. Why should this banking feature that we call a card payment hassle our payment procedures when it was like quite easier when we paid by cash. We just take the $5 bill from your pocket and give it to the cashier and that's it. With blockchain, financial industry, there would be no settlement because the payment and the settlement is in the same activity. It's just a change and update in the ledger. One transaction in the ledger. And that's what we call peer-to-peer -peer payment. And this is 
the first use case of blockchain. We have a lot of examples from Airfox, Circle, Veeam, and Swift Network. Another use case is real estate. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you know that 70% of the people in the world who have land have weak title to it? Let's give an example that happened in uh, Honduras, the Central American country. Let's say you have a little farm in Honduras. Some dictator comes to power. He says, I know you've got a piece of paper that says you own your farm, but the government computer, again, the central server, the government computer says that my uh, brother or my friend owns your farm, and he takes your farm. This happened on a mass scale in Honduras, and this problem exists everywhere. As per the great Latin American economist, Hernando de Soto, this is number one issue in the world in terms of economic mobility. Even more important than having a bank account. Because if you don't have a valid title to your land, you can't borrow against it. And you can't plan for your future. So today, companies are working with governments to put land titles on a blockchain. And once it's there, this is immutable and you can't change it. Moving to the sharing economy. A lot of people talk about Uber, uh, Airbnb, and Lyft, and so on, as part of what we call the sharing economy. This is a very powerful idea that peers can come together and create and share services. But are these companies really sharing? In fact, they are successful precisely because they don't share. They aggregate services together and they sell them. Let me tell you what Vitalik Buterin said about Uber. He said, whereas most technologies tend to automate workers on the periphery, blockchain automates at the center. So, Instead of putting the taxi driver out of a job, blockchain puts Uber out of a job and lets the taxi driver work with the customer directly. And this is very important. So what do Uber actually do? They use the driver car, effort, time, and sell all that to a client while adding their profit margin, which is 35%, by the way. Yes. 35% is the cost of their sharing services. So what if rather than uh, Airbnb being a 55 billion uh, corporation currently, there was a distributed application on a blockchain. We can call it, for example, the Airbnb. And it was essentially owned by all the people who have a room to rent. And once someone wants to Rent a room, go to the blockchain application with all the criteria they select. So, so it helps them find the right room. And then the blockchain helps with the smart contracts in contacting and identifying the parties, handle the payments through digital payments and directly to the wallet of the room owner. It even can handle the reputation because if she rates a room as a five star, that room is there and it is rated again, it's immutable. No one can change it. Another use case of blockchain and an important one is the international money transfer. You know that the biggest flow of funds from the developed countries to the developing world is not corporate investment and it's not even foreign aid, it's money transfer or what we call the remittances. This is the global diaspora, people who left their home countries, and they are sending money back to their families at home. This is like 600 billion US dollar a year, and it's growing. But these people are getting ripped off. How? So currently, in order to send money abroad, one should go to the money company office, 
wait in a long queue sometimes, pay a high commission, around 10% in most cases, and the money will take four to seven days to get home. Well, let's take an example, the case of Anali Domingo, which is a housekeeper. She lives in Toronto, and every month she goes to the Western Union office with some cash to send her remittances to her mom in Manila, Philippines. It costs her around 10%. The money takes four to seven days to get there, and her mom never knows when it's going to arrive. It takes five hours out of her week to do this. Well, one of Anali's friends has introduced her to a blockchain application called Abra. And from her mobile device, she sent 300 bucks, it went directly to her mom mobile device. She got a notification that Anali sent you $300. And then she looked to the interface. As you can see here, we have a map like the Uber uh, interface. There's Abra tellers moving around. She clicks on a teller that has a five-star uh, teller reputation who's like seven minutes away. The guy show up at the door, gives her Filipino pesos. She put them in her wallet and that's it. The whole thing took minutes and it cost her 1% only. Let's talk about digital data, privacy, an, an important uh, use case of blockchain. The most powerful assets of the digital age that we are living currently is data. And data is really a new asset class, maybe bigger than previous asset classes like uh, land under the agriculture economy or industrial plant or even money. Asset data is created by each one of you, of us. We create this asset because it's a mirror image of us. And this virtual you may know more about you than you do. Because simply, we can't remember what we have bought a year ago or what we have said a year ago or the exact location, our exact location a year ago. But uh, Facebook knows. Uh, you you wake up uh, in the morning, you have a notification from Facebook. Uh, it's a memory uh, telling you that you were uh, in Dubai Mall like three years ago. This is a big problem, that this virtual you is not owned by you. While well, using blockchain, companies are working to create an identity in a black box in a way that only gives away the piece of information that is needed. This will help to protect our privacy. For example, you can stop those social media companies to targeting you or selling your information to, to merchants or targeting you in non-relevant ads. Also, you can get compensated if you accept to sell your own data. So whenever you see an ad, you'll get some money in your Facebook wallet, for example. Another example is in the intellectual property is uh, music. So there's a whole number of creators of content, musicians. They don't receive fair compensation because the intellectual property is broken with the internet. A lot of piracy. You can download any MP3 song and listen. So at 25 years ago, for example, if you wrote a hit song, you got millions of singles. The, the singer or the songwriter can get for like $45,000. Today, he, he can uh, get less than $36, for example. So Imogen Heap, a Grammy-winning singer and songwriter, is now putting her music on a blockchain ecosystem. She called that Mycelia. It's a blockchain application. And the music has a smart contact, uh, contract surrounding it. And this protects her intellectual property. So you want to listen to the song, maybe it's free, or you can uh, pay some micro cents. You want to put the song in a film, it's totally different. 
it's very important because now she's protecting her intellectual property, her rights on the song. She's marketing his, uh, herself and she, uh, the, the, the song become a business with its related payment system as if the bank. And it's directly go to the uh, artist wallet. Again, without those intermediaries. So there's no need here to EMI or Sony or Warner Music or Rotana in, in, the, uh, in our region. Moving to academic frauds. Uh, fraud represents a grave danger in any society. Recently, dozens of cases of counterfeit or fake academies degrees covering a wide range of specialization have been discovered worldwide. Some of the fake degrees belong to officials, soldiers, or other position in the uh, higher ranked positions. You can see in the image, we have uh, some examples from India and China and UK. For example, in, in the UK, 3,000 medics uh, are currently reviewed because after uh, 22 years, they discovered a doctor, a female doctor, uh, uh, practicing medicine without real papers. So with blockchain, the solution can be very simple and straightforward, and in two steps only. First, using a human-readable PDF electronic certificate, so the publisher, let's say university or any institution, can introduce or can include the information on the PDF and put it on a blockchain. Then the certificate can be validated to be genuine using the blockchain by simply going to the online validator, which can be the university website, for example, upload the PDF file and get an immediate response. This is, my, uh, for example, my personal certificate verified by the University of Nicosia, Cyprus, with all related details. This is a real example using blockchain where you can see the uh, issuer, the issuer verification ID, my ID, and even you can see my grade. So, those were only some of dozens of application where blockchain can help creating an economy and uh, solve some of the world's most difficult problem. I think that's all for today. This is just a small briefing about blockchain. If you are interested to know more and go deeper, feel free to contact AZ Tech and ask on our uh, course Understanding Blockchain and register to our upcoming session. Now, I'm ready to answer your questions if you have any. So, is there any question? I can see people are typing, so I'll be waiting. Thank you for your kind comments. We have a couple of minutes if someone has a question or they want to go in some deep details. Okay. I have a question from Joshua. Can legacy data be uploaded to blockchain? If yes, how it is verified? This is a good question, uh, uh, Joshua. Uh, in blockchain, first, we, we don't store the whole data. So it's not a database. As you can see that I mentioned a couple of times that we only uh, put transactions on blockchain. So uh, whenever Take, for example, the, the academic certificate. Whenever you want to uh, validate the certificate on blockchain, 
you you don't put the whole certificates on the blockchain it's not like a server where we put the certificate we validated with a blockchain we only put the hash of this certificate on a blockchain so uh, you don't store the whole data on the blockchain you take the certificate from the university you validate it on the blockchain you include the hash function in the pdf what we called a metadata and again to validate it as i said you you go to the upload and upload the pdf version and check this metadata so a blockchain it's not a database in terms of storing data because because we will need a huge space and all of that it stores only the transactions or what we call the hash functions hopefully i i answered your question So, uh, any other question? You're most welcome, Joshua. Hopefully, uh, I answered your uh, your question well so i'll be i'll wait like uh, one or two minutes if someone has a question i'll be happy to answer again uh, today i tried to provide like this introduction a brief introduction on the blockchain as uh, as technology on the key concepts and some of the use cases, uh, we have a lot of other use cases and real projects uh, that are applied in blockchain. And uh, each part of this uh, introduction can, can be taken into details. For example, the cryptography part, the uh, blockchain interconnection, how it's secure. Uh, all that can be done in a detailed lecture later on. We have a question, uh, can financial regulators use the blockchain to get bank customers information directly to validate data integrity? Yes, and this is one of the most uh, applications of blockchain in what we know as KYC or know your customer. Currently, major banks worldwide are doing some consortium, starting by JP Morgan, uh, HSBC and other banks. They are uh, doing a consortium using what we call Ripple blockchain. Uh, and one of the most applications they are working are is the KYC or Know Your Customer, where they can validate the user or the uh, uh, customer information directly and one more time and using blockchain. So currently, uh, multiple banks in a given country, if you go to a bank and you have to open an account, they will do your KYC. And if you go to another bank, they will also do the process, the KYC. And some studies, uh, statistical studies, mention that banks can uh, leverage cost by more than 35% by having a single platform for KYC. Hopefully, uh, this, is, uh, this is, was your main question, uh, Amadi. Great. Okay, guys. So, uh, yes, the name of the blockchain technology by JP Morgan, it's, it's called the Ripple. I will, I will write it. Ripple. It's not just by JP Morgan, it's initiated by JP Morgan and uh, it contains like a consortium or a group of banks and other financial institutes and other big enterprises that are working together on this uh, consortium, mainly for banking and financial applications in blockchain. 
Okay. Uh, I'm happy that uh, we met today virtually. Hopefully, uh, later on, we can uh, see each other face to face. Please stay safe and thank you for your time. Goodbye.